Ah, uh, okay, it's a bit off center, but then again, so am I. Borada, uh, Ruan Dui, and, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Ruan, and I don't know why I picked up this brush other than stuff. I don't know. So, where was I going with this? Why did I even start filming right now? Why did I start filming today? Why did I ever start filming at all? Who knows? Uh, so, where was I going? Right places with stuff. I thought uh, long and hard about this, especially since it's been about a month since all shit broke loose on YouTube, and specifically LGBTube, and as a result, every trans person on the YouTube, plus their eccentric aunts, had something to say about this, and, um, and then what happens is I turn the things back around and do that. Uh, so yeah, everybody and their eccentric uh, family members had a thing and a half to say about the such event, which would be uh, Trisha Paytas making her latest coming out as somehow LGBT without anything meaningful behind it. And I say this for, I say without anything meaningful behind it for a reason, which I should get to, right? Of course. So, um, I kind of take it with a point of pride that I have yet to see, well, depending on your definitions of said anyway, I have yet to see an entire Trisha Paytas video, um, as in one hosted on uh, Paytas' own channel, and more specifically, one that is not a collaboration with Amelia Fart. So earlier this year, um, the whole, like, Amelia Fart, she went to Los Angeles and had that kind of storyline on her own videos about vaguely stalking Trisha Paytas, and, um, I did watch those videos. There's one on Amelia Fart's video, and there's one or on Amelia Fart's channel, and there's one on Paytas' own channel. And I watched both of them, and I forget exactly which one this was in. Um, like, whose channel ended up hosting the one that I'm going to refer to in one hot little minute. Paytas said in this video, and like I said, I forget if this is on... Um, Paytas' channel, or if it's on Amelia Fart's channel, but it's on one of the two. Uh, Trish Paytas, uh, has, says that one of her most, more significant influences as, um, as a performer, as an entertainer, is Andy Kaufman. Now, it's gonna sound like I'm getting sidetracked for a bit here, but stay with me. Stay with me. This is all gonna make sense in the end. Because this is what happens when I work through ideas for a few weeks before I start filming myself. Okay? Like, <laughs> this is just how my brain works. I make these thoughts, and they're all connected somehow. But then again, the same thing, you know, my dad did. So, oh well, I guess insanity is hereditary. So, where was I going with this? Right. Uh, so... I just mentioned that Paytas cited as a major influence on her career as an entertainer, as a performer, as a video blog artist of sorts, uh, was Andy Kaufman. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the name, uh, Andy Kaufman is generally referred to by most people in the here and now as 
the original troll comedian. And this is sort of, this sort of does a discredit to a lot of what he did. For, and plus, it's kind of disrespectful to how the man even saw his own um, work as a performer. Uh, first off, the man preferred to be called um, simply an entertainer, but Wikipedia um, specifically refers to him as a performance artist, which is a lot, you know, that's... Even that is kind of vague. So, okay, the most... Many people about my age uh, first heard of Andy Kaufman from either one of two ways. Either A, we were watching reruns of Taxi as kids. Um, I didn't really, like, it was on on reruns when I was a kid, but... I don't know, for some reason, even though it wasn't at all, like, the comedy of Taxi was about on the same level as Night Court, which is still one of my favorite shows ever, um, but for some reason, like, I don't know, I, I, I got it in my head that, like, when I would see reruns happening, that my parents would not be okay if I was caught watching them, because for some reason, I may, I devised the idea in my head that for some reason, they would not be okay with it. I, I watching it as an adult now. Like I don't know where I got this idea because I was like, I, I like the first time I rem remember specifically saying something about that. I think it was to my aunt, which would be the one I frequently forget to call. But I've been remembering lately. But yeah, so either we remember Andy Kaufman from a character he played on Taxi, and this character was loosely based on one of his um, theatrical performance characters. And I say theatrical performance because, um, you know, people like to, like, I don't know, like, regard the foreign man character as, like, a stand-up character, but, I don't know, it's not quite, you know? Um, but yeah, Latka Gravis on Taxi was loosely based on one of Kaufman's characters, uh, who Kaufman just referred to as Foreign Man. Or, we know of Andy Kaufman through, um, the, um, Jim Carrey starring biopic Man on the Moon, which was named after the, uh, song by R.E.M. Um, we may have also become familiar with, uh, Andy Kaufman through the song Man on the Moon by R.E.M., which, um... You could say that counts for myself as well. I don't know. But yeah, like, I kind of, like, was aware of Taxi. And of course, like, the name Andy Kaufman I first recognized from the song. And then, of course, the Jim Carrey film came out some years later. Uh, but that's about... I don't know. So that... So, uh, yeah. Andy Kaufman. Now, Andy Kaufman, like I said, he's often sort of, like referred to just kind of vaguely as the original troll comedian, which is a bit of a disservice. Because, uh, his performances, like, w w even went beyond simple stage performances, like, you know, at you know, something scheduled at, like, a big theater, or um, Open Mic Nights was, I think, where he first debuted Foreign Man who became the basis for Latka Gravis on Taxi. But I digress. So, um... But a lot of Kaufman's performances, I would consider sort of a prototype to these augmented reality games like Pokemon Go or the uh, smartphone game Ingress, which Pokemon Go is based on. Like, the, the, the two games literally use the same maps. Like, Pokemon Go was um, developed along, you know, like, co-developed with the team that worked on Ingress. But I digress. So, um, and I would say, like I said, I would say Kaufman's performance style was, you know, probably 
best regarded as a prototype for this augmented reality sort of thing. Like, this was loosely based on real life, or at least people's real-life perceptions of things. And he would augment this, you know, what we understood of reality with these performances that included a degree of audience participation even if you did not realize you were participating in the performance. Like, he said that one of his goals as an entertainer, as a performer, was that um, positively or negatively, he wanted the audience to walk away entertained. Like, th that, that this thing had done something um, to their head. That this had somehow affected their evening. Like I said, for positive or for negative, this is what he wanted. If people had a negative reaction and walked out, that was just as good. If people had a positive reaction and stayed, not necessarily because they understood it, but because, but possibly even because they weren't sure if they understood it. They didn't want to understand it, maybe even. But, you know, somehow they thought this was great for some reason. And you know, the more mixed response he would get, the better he considered it. A lot of times, yes, he specifically wanted a significant portion of the audience to hate what he was doing, and to hate him for it. And, but because he knew there would always be somebody who would enjoy this. Like, uh, well, you know, the Sasha Baron Cohen films, um, Borat, and, uh, crap, the other one. The other one. The one that nobody knows as much as they know Borat. You know, that, like, specifically Borat, because a lot of people were kind of angry. Or maybe that was just, like, part of the, um, what's it called? Promotional material around it. Like, you know, saying that people were angry that they didn't know they that this was, like, all, like, a troll of sorts. But yeah, like, think of that. Think of, like, Borat. Like, this was, like, Kaufman, like, Kaufman was doing this bef God damn, yeah, Baron Cohen's about, he, he's not that much older than me, like, a couple years, something like that. So, yeah, like, Kaufman was doing Borat when Sasha Baron Cohen was, like, still in diapers, at the very least. I mean, at the most, anyway, for Cohen, but... The, when, then where was I going? Right. I was going to the place with the thing. So, I first... Now, I first really got into Andy Kaufman um, through Laurie Anderson. This is going to sound really roundabout, and it sounds... Um, and I'm sure it sounds just bonkers, like, if you're aware of Laurie Anderson or something. But, um, if you're not, she's a musician. She's an avant-garde musician. She has invented a couple of musical instruments. I know she's classically um, trained on viola. I think she's also studied uh, jazz discipline for viola as well. Uh, she's also singer-songwriter, composer. Uh, she is also known amongst some people as Lou Reed's widow. In fact, like, those two were so perfect together, like, when Lou Reed died, first off, my thought went to, my, my immediate thoughts after I learned Lou Reed had died was, how is Laurie Anderson dealing with this? Like, how is she coping? And then I was really surprised to learn that they were married less than half the time I thought they were. Like, they were just that perfect together. Something about Lou Reed and Laurie Anderson just made so much sense to me. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I really got interested in... Um, Andy Kaufman through Laurie Anderson. How is that, you ask? It sounds like these were two completely different kinds of uh, performers, entertainers, what's a who's it? And yes, you would be correct. So here's the thing is um, uh, there were two performances that um, were dramatized in the um, in the Jim Carrey film, which I don't hate it as much as a lot of Kaufman fans do. It's okay. Um, 
I know it's really cool to hate on Nostalgia Critic and Channel Awesome and all that, but Doug Walker's review of Man on the Moon and um, the Jim and Andy documentary about Jim Carrey playing Andy Kaufman in Man on the Moon, uh, yeah, that, that kind of sums up my thoughts a little bit. He's a little bit harsher than I feel is necessary, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I, I'm a little bit forgiving of some of the things that I dislike about it, because I figure, okay, if this is how somebody becomes interested in Andy Kaufman, it could be worse. Like, it could have been much worse. But, like I said, uh, two of the things that were dramatized in the Man on the Moon film were, um, uh, one of them was, um, I'm gonna get to this real quick because I just mentioned Laurie Anderson, and this was, uh, this was actually a little bit later in his career. Um, he did this thing where he would, uh, challenge feminists to wrestle him in the ring, as in the professional wrestling ring. Andy Kaufman, an untrained man, uh, challenging women to wrestle him. And, um, now I bring this up because of Laurie Anderson, because Laurie Anderson was a friend of Kaufman's who was involved in this stunt. See, that's one of the things. It's like, Kaufman, um, as the, you know, feminist wrestler challenge character, also named Andy Kaufman, because, like I said, augmented reality. Part of what he was saying with this uh, was that some of the ideas that uh, this was really popular with second wave feminism was that um, women and men... Um, are fundamentally equal in all ways. Uh, this is not how second wave feminism has been characterized in recent years, uh, but it was it was a really popular idea amongst some segments of second wave feminists. But you know, so just bear with me here. So you know, if you're if you're saying that you are equal to you know that if you um, you know a woman, which would be not me, um, if you believe you're equal in all ways to a man, like, emotionally, intellectually, physically, then taking up the challenge to wrestle this untrained man, this, you know, should, you know, result in a tie. But if you didn't take up his challenge, then you probably don't fully believe what you're saying. So, Lori Anderson seeing some potential in this that it's uh, that it kind of highlights an absurdity in um, in certain areas of feminist thought that you know like that that 100% um, you know emotional mental intellectual physical equality between the sexes you know it's it doesn't seem to hold up to reality and I know People are going to be debating this until, you know, they're blue in the face and, okay, I did do that. And Laurie Anderson, she was in on this performance a couple of times. She would be an audience member planted. Like, she would be planted amongst the audience. Would accept this challenge. <laughs> and, of course, you know, uh, once or twice uh, it was uh, it was intentionally... Uh, it was intended that he would th throw it, I think, I think one time maybe, yeah, I think one time he threw it, but, you know, she tended to throw it, um, and, you know, let him maintain the upper hand in it, but still, it's like, this is so, <laughs> when somebody who I respect enough that, you know, um, her spouse, who's the one that most people know about and respect so much more, if only because they've heard a more of his work, you know, like, my first thought when Lou Reed died went to Laurie Anderson, so clearly, like, Laurie Anderson's work as a musician, as an artist, it just, it just stands out so much to me, so I had to be like, okay, I'd seen parts of Man on the Moon, and, you know, it was like, it seemed like typical Jim Carrey fare, 
So, okay, yeah, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna, you know, get a little bit more, I'm gonna di dive a little bit more into what Kaufman is doing, and, you know, see like, what, if I can see what Laurie Anderson saw. Now, of course, I got into Kaufman, like, long before Lou Reed died, but, um, 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 where was I going? Right, right. So, and now another, um, character of Kaufman's who was dramatized in the film was, you know, a bit more in the Borat area. This was Tony Clifton. Tony Clifton does not exist. <laughs> like, um, Tony Clifton with few exceptions, and I, I'll get to that in a second. With few exceptions, Tony Clifton was Andy Kaufman in a wig and cheap aviator sunglasses and a fat suit and usually a loud light blue um, lounge tuxedo leisure suit sort of thing. Um, I know the powder blue one was pulled out most in the Man on the Moon film. Uh, but yeah, Tony Clifton, even when it was obvious it was Andy Kaufman in a wig and a fat suit, Kaufman would insist he is not Tony Clifton. Kaufman would insist Tony Clifton is his manager, who is a completely separate person, and every once in a while, note I said almost always, obviously Andy Kaufman in a, in a wig and a fat suit, every once in a while, in order to maintain the illusion that Tony Clifton may have been a different person, his friend uh, Bob Zmuda would put on the Tony Clifton wig and aviators and fat suit and affect that, wow, more than that, Tony Clifton, blah, 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 blah. like, you know, he, it would be this loud, gruff, affected voice that, you know, there are some differences between Zmuda as Tony Clifton and Kaufman as Tony Clifton, but, um, like I said, you know, until the day he died, Kaufman insisted Tony Clifton was not himself. Like, he would say, no, 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 Tony Clifton. Like, even if it was very obviously Andy Kaufman in a wig and fat suit. But there were just times it was very obviously Andy Kaufman in a wig and a fat suit. And he would be, like, on, you know, like, say, The Tonight Show, for example. Like, he'd be on The Tonight Show w one night as Tony Clifton. And then, like, a couple weeks later, he would be on uh, the Tonight Show as himself. And Carson would say, oh, well, you know, last week when, when you were here, oh, no, that wasn't me. That was Tony Clifton. I'm not Tony Clifton. Tony Clifton's my manager. And there are people who still believe that, um, what color is this? Uh, that what? That Andy Kaufman faked his own death. Um, now there's a couple reasons. One of which being that he once said in an interview that he would probably fake his own death. Um, another reason being that he did die. This is indeed true. Like, he did die. It is against general practice, but the, um, the, the, the Los Angeles County did release his death certificate on at least two occasions, I believe, just to confirm that he did die. Uh, yeah, um, Kaufman died of a rare form of lung cancer, uh, that only really affects non-smokers. But, like I said, it is a rare form of lung cancer, and Kaufman was a non-smoker. His girlfriend was there in the hospital room the moment he died. Uh, she has said that, you know, like, somebody would have had to literally switch his body with a dead ringer look-alike. A moment when she went to go pee or something, and... I don't know. Like, like she's just like, you know, it would have had to been incredibly elaborate for it to even fool me. So yeah, like, his, his girlfriend at the time was there. His brother has says, well, you know, part of him really wants to hold out hope that, you know, maybe Andy is still around, but no, he genuinely believes Kaufman died, okay? Like, his own brother is saying this. Now, his brother may or may, may not have been involved in a hoax with Andy's daughter, um, you can see this, like, you can search it online. It was a kind of famous about 10 years ago, somewhere in that area. Um, wasn't all terribly long ago, I know that much. So, then what happens? Right, uh, I was bringing up Tony Clifton, and I brought up Tony Clifton, and I was segued 
uh, like that for a reason, and that is because, um, you know, like I said, uh, there are people who still believe Kaufman faked his own death, and one of those reasons is most likely Bob Zmuda, because it usually was Zmuda who put on the Tony Clifton wig and aviators and fat suit when, you know, they wanted to prove it wasn't Andy, um, a year to the day after Andy Kaufman died, Bob Zmuda put on the Tony Clifton wig and fat suit, and in tribute to Andy, put on a Tony Clifton performance. Tony Clifton, the character, was, like I said, like, Andy Kaufman's fictional manager, uh, was also a washed-up, or would have been washed up if he had any talent at all, lounge singer who, um, you know, didn't really have talent. He was loud and boorish and brash and... You know, just like everything you're supposed to hate about the stereotype of, you know, like the, like the Rat Pack scene. Like, he was he was kind of a... I, I hesitate to say parody, because parody implies some amount of respect, but the way that um, Tony Clif the Tony Clifton character uh, lampooned the whole, like, Rat Pack sort of deal. It was kind of like mocking this. Like I said, I hesitate to say parody. And parody implies that, you know, there is some amount of respect behind it. Now that I've clued everybody in, if they have not, if they are not aware of Andy Kaufman before, now you have a rough idea of Andy Kaufman's life and career, um, well, not too incredibly rough, because I went into some detail, like, you know, especially with, like, Tony Clifton thing, and actually, I, like, went into a bit of detail. But, you know, it, it's a truncated detail. Like, if you want to know far more, go to your local library, find a biography on Andy Kaufman. I think there's an actual real documentary, too. So, when Trisha Paytas says that one of her significant influences on her career as an entertainer is Andy Kaufman. This suddenly brings, you know, anything she says into question. And I'm really torn. Like, on one hand, I almost want to play devil's advocate. Like, playing devil's advocate does generally imply, at the very least imply, that one does not wholly, if at all, believe in the position one is taking in the conversation, but one is using various debating techniques to try and rationalize that position. Uh, sometimes, uh, this is done for good. Um, sometimes this is done quite disingenuously. Uh, Paytas makes it really hard for me to play devil's advocate on this. And, where's the thing I wanted? I don't know. Now, like I said, I have a fair amount of respect for Andy Kaufman's career as a performer. I mean, th this... As a performer, as an entertainer, he was at least impressive enough to Laurie Anderson that she worked with him on a few occasions. But at the same time, even I was not completely sold on Andy Kaufman's death until... Um, like I said, the whole, like, Andy's daughter hoax from up to ten years ago. Um, I was not completely sold that he had not faked his death until his, uh, his record was released by the, uh, by the county coroner, um, to dispel the hoax there. So, when your whole career as a performer is based on um, holding up a mirror to some of the absurdities by immersing oneself in a character that is a parody of what people want to believe, <laughs> right? So, like, Trisha Paytas, like, somebody 
somebody, I forget who exactly um, I was watching this week, has uh, um, summed up Paytas, oh, I think it was Creep Show Art, but uh, but yeah, somebody I was watching this week summed up Paytas' character as, you know, it's like the stereotype of the, you know, dumb blonde character turned up to 11. Like, she will say bonkers shit because it really does, like, highlight what people really want to believe about her. So when Paytas is, you know, claiming to be um, a gay trans man, the trans community, at least the the more t discussed um, trans activists in the here and now, say, you know, believe anybody who says that they are trans is indeed trans. But then we get into this, into this weird area where we have Paytas, and I, who is not only, what is this one? Did I? Is this new? I think this is new. Like, we have Paytas, who is basically making, like, not even, like, she did that music video dressed up in drag, basically, and then decides to come out as trans. Now, a cynical dipshit like myself would see that as, you know, just like opportunistic advertising for this music video she did. I think that's the timeline of events. Like I said, I haven't really watched, like, not counting the Amelia Fart um, collaborative efforts, I haven't watched a complete um, Trisha Paytas video. Like, I, I have watched her through other YouTubers, usually people making snarky comments, um, just because, like, what I have seen doesn't impress me enough to, um, you know, uh, um, devote any amount of time to, um, eh, I think I'm gonna go with this one. Uh, the, uh, the trans community, um, or at least the, uh, some of the more prominent internet activism that we see lately says that we are supposed to believe that anybody who says they are trans is trans. And uh, Rose of Dawn, I watch her. Uh, I've been watching her since before, uh, just before, I want to say, the whole um, Jessica Yaniv thing really blew up and enhanced her uh, subscriber count. But that's just... That's just, um, that's, that's just me. Uh, so, then what happens is, uh, uh, Rose of Dawn did this video, uh, basically, like, calling out the fact that a lot of the people on, a lot of the trans people on YouTube, on YouTube and Twitter saying, oh, believe all trans people, believe anybody who says they are trans is trans. And then Trish Paytas did this thing, and they're just like, Trish, you're not trans. And... I'm pretty sure Rose of Dawn, like, you know, like, did a, did a call-out of a couple specific names. I don't know, it's been a while since I've seen that video. It's been almost a month at this point. Like I said, I, I kind of want to play Devil's Advocate, but Paytas makes it really hard to. And, um, I mean, another reason that I, I almost wish I could bring myself to play Devil's Advocate here is because, um, 20 years ago, like, before I even started with all of this, which I did before I started with all of this. Um, I'm sure if I thought about it for maybe 10 minutes, you know, like with pen and paper, I could name a people who took me then about as seriously as most trans people are taking Paytas now about, you know, this whole stunt of... Paytas's. I found somebody like, yeah, you know, just like making some of some really really weak defenses of Paytas coming out as trans. And like I said, these are these are pretty weak defenses, but at the same time, like I said, I wish I could be sympathetic because like I said, 20 years ago, I'm sure there were people 
who took, I'm sure I could name people who took me as seriously then as most trans people are taking Paytas now. I, I'm, I'm sure I could name at least five people. Because, um, prior to all of this, they were as big as my head. And when they're as big as your head, you do a lot of really stupid, self-destructive things if all of the information you believe to be correct says you will never be allowed to transition. Even if we, um, even if there was not the whole, like, influenced by Kaufman angle that makes it really hard for me to play devil's advocate for Paytas, it's like, here's where we come to the point where, like, if I were going to take Paytas uh, coming out as trans on good faith and say that, you know, maybe she's just putting into this in some of the stupidest ways possible, it's like, I still can't, like, I cannot in good consciousness take that seriously. Because if I were to take that seriously, now some might say, oh, well, isn't that hypocritical if you're saying that, oh, that was big my head and you did some really stupid self-destructive dysphoria-enhancing things, you know, when they were as big as your head. Like, okay, yeah, like, that, that is, that is, that is, um, I'm, I'm sure it seems that way, but like I said, knowing what I know now, being 20 years older than I was then, I was five years younger than Paytas, at least five years younger than Paytas is now when I started transitioning 13 years ago. So, if I were to take that seriously and, you know, handle the Paytas situation with kid gloves like, um, like Gigi Gorgeous is claiming to, and now, I think I briefly mentioned that, but I forgot to finish the thought. It's like, the Gigi Gorgeous little video that she did, like, saying, you know, that she's going to refer to Paytas as, you know, a gay man. I'm like, as far as I'm concerned, this is just Gigi Gorgeous putting on the putting on the Tony Clifton wig and fat suit and saying that, you know, like, being Bob Zamuda to Paytas Andy Kaufman and saying, look, see, like, Tony Clifton is a completely different person. He's not Andy Kaufman. <laughs> like, you know, except when he's Bob Zamuda in a fat suit, right? <laughs> right? So, but, yeah, like, considering, like I said, I, I was, I was, uh, I was a good, like, five or six years younger than Paytas is now when I started transitioning. And I did that when I got good information about what my options were. Like, there, there's a huge huge to-do about, like, what finally got that fire lit under my keister to transition medically and everything. Uh, it did involve a weekend-long emotional breakdown, um, but it also involved learning that, that everything that I thought I knew for the whole, like, you know, like, seven years or so previous that, it was all wrong. It was all wrong. It was all wrong. I had options. I just, one, let transphobia inform my ideas about those options, and two, I let a completely stupid book written by a former Sea Org officer, Scientologist named Kate Bornstein, she wrote a book called Gender Outlaw, and if I knew then what I knew what I know now about her, that about the whole like like or more specifically, if I knew as much about Scientology and Sea Org then as I do now, I probably wouldn't have read Gender Outlaw. I might have like gotten myself medically transitioning a good five you know, maybe a few years earlier than I actually did. Cause Bornstein had this way of just like t convincing you that even if you are feeling more dysphoric than you ever felt in your life, you are completely right to not do anything about it. And so that is where I, like, like if I were to... Okay. <laughs> if I were to take Paytas' latest little, like, you know, trans 
video um, at face value. If I were to take this in good faith and say, I believe her, I would not at all advocate handling this with kid gloves, especially now, especially with the, with the breakthroughs just in trans, just in access to trans care. Like, while the options were open to me before I knew they were, it was one of those deals where, because Medicare didn't officially cover it, like, you had to find doctors who were willing to engage in creative billing practices for the well-being of the patient, which did happen. It did happen. Um, in fact, um, a few weeks before this surgery, I was on LiveJournal talking with a bunch of other trans guys, and somebody was saying that he was on Medicare, like I was then and still am now, and by everything he's looked at, there's no reason his HRT should have been covered, but it was. Right? Like, he had to pay, like, the... Well, back then it was like a dollar and five, now it's like a dollar and thirty cents, you know, out of pocket for this. So, like I said, and this was before, this was at, oh god, yeah, so that was a few weeks before this, so that was at least 12, 13 years ago. And, um, trans, um, medical care has not been officially covered by Medicare or Medicaid, um, which is like the state, you know, level stuff, whereas Medicare is federal level. So it's like, this hasn't been officially covered by government, uh, health care uh, until, like, I want to say 2013. I want to say 2013 was the first year this was officially covered. So like I said, I started transitioning 13 years ago. It was only officially covered six years ago. And since it's been officially covered by Medicare and Medicaid, private insurance agencies have been gradually accepting more trans coverage. So you can't tell me that Trisha Paytas, in this day and age, if she is meaningfully trans, would be completely unaware of any of this. You cannot tell me that, yeah, th that, that this would be an option somehow out of her reach. The woman gets more money in the first hour one of her YouTube videos is up than I get in social security disability in a year, right? Or at least that's the impression that websites like Social Blade give me, right? So, don't tell me that if she is indeed meaningfully trans, that she has no options. And... This is where I gotta, like, disagree with a lot of people saying that they're non-binary. Is that, like, I don't know, like, as I've said many times before, I know of four basic kinds of non-binary people. Think of it like a pyramid. Think of it like a pyramid of non-binary. It's not a spectrum, it's a pyramid. Because at the top of the pyramid, where it's, like, the pointiest, You've got people who genuinely experience gender dysphoria when they are um, read and or expected to function within their communities as either men or as women. Because in this society, we don't really have a neither function, okay? So these are people who are genuinely dysphoric regardless of, you know, being read as men or as women. Then, Peter, paring it down a little bit, We've got, I'd say, like, the next two are probably equal enough in numbers, but let's just say, like, number two is this group, which is, honestly, a lot of autistic people who's... I'm trying to word this in the best way possible, but, like, due to neurodivergence... This is just the best language they have to communicate their gender, okay? Because 
a disproportionate number of people in various, like, non-binary groups online are autistic. To some degree or another, okay? So, like, third tier down, we've got people, you know, like myself, like ContraPoints, like... I forget. Cat Black. Cat Black's another person I know. Like, you know, we're, we're binary trans people for all general, you know, like, best understood definitions. But for a period of time, we have a non-binary identity publicly as sort of a coping mechanism to ease our communities online and off, our families, our friends, etc., etc., into our transitioning. And whether we are conscious of the fact that we're doing this or not may vary, but, you know, like, it is, as per my experiences, a fairly common thing for, you know, non-binary people to end up being binary trans. And then... The fourth at the bottom is people like uh, Joshua, Tobia, or whoever it is, like people who are just like basically like gender non-conforming cis, but think that's enough to give them leverage into the trans community. So it's like, th 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 and that fourth tier at the bottom, that widest tier, that's not meaningfully trans. Like, people on that rung of the pyramid share nothing really in common with me. Like, I would absolutely believe that's what Trisha Paytas is doing, uh, especially given a lot of the really bizarre things she said about, you know, how she allegedly identifies as male because you know like oh well, I don't wear makeup all the time like yeah like very few like people who are indeed women wear makeup all the time like that, that's that's not like failure to you know conform to social standards or expectations I guess is the more accurate thing. Like, failure to conform to so certain social expectations of one's gender is not meaningfully trans. It's, like, it, it's not the same thing. Like, I don't know I'm a man because, <laughs> you know, I don't enjoy makeup. Like, obviously, I, I do. I enjoy it quite a bit, and I'm taking these out even though they're not dried because clearly I planned things very poorly. Um, but yeah, like, I'm not... I don't know I'm male because of my relationship with makeup. I know I'm male because since I was a small child, like, I would... Like, small children... They don't have the sophisticated language that adults do, but they generally have an understanding of their gender identity. Um, and some kids do have a very fluid understanding of their gender identity, and that's fine. Some people just do, but it's like, your average kid has some understanding of their gender identity. Like I said, they don't say it, they don't have the most sophisticated language to explain it to others. But it's like, when I was like four and five years old, I would see Freddie Mercury in the Queen albums, like long-haired glam rock era Freddie Mercury, right? With the, with the long hair and the sequins and the coal-rimmed eyes and very obviously, like, you know, because a lot of times those jumpsuits would be, like, split down to the navel, you know, or just below, right? And, you know, so very obviously, a guy who just had long hair and coal around his eyes, and I would see that, and that's, that's 
who I saw myself being like when I grew up. And I'm not too far from that. You know, when I was uh, 13 years old, I wanted to be Mark Bolin when I grew up. You know, obviously, I, I, I got a perm in my hair so I could look more like Mark Bolin when I grew up. It's just... And yeah, like 13, it's a bit older, got more sophisticated vocabulary than a five-year-old, but like I said, like this is just like, you know, like when I was seven, I, I, I wanted to be Boy George. Like I, when I was like nine, I was really into Annie Lennox. And I kind of wanted to be like Annie Lennox, but the reason that I kind of wanted to be Annie Lennox when I was nine is because I thought Annie Lennox was drag queen. Like, I honestly thought Annie Lennox was a drag queen until I was like 10 years old. Like, I, my mother was a Frank Zappa groupie. My mother was a Frank Zappa groupie. I grew up with posters of Alice Cooper in my home, right? I knew that men could use feminine names if they wanted to, especially if they were musicians. You know, like my mother, um... Abandoned a mediocre career in opera where men wear wigs and makeup on stage with alarming regularity because that's theater, right? So yeah, like, I thought Annie Lennox was a drag queen. And when I discovered Annie Lennox was not a drag queen, I legit felt betrayed. Like, I'm nine years old. I, I, I like, the closest thing, like, I did not realize. I honestly thought Annie Lennox was a drag queen. That's why, like... My idol when I was nine was Annie Lennox, because I thought she was a drag queen. I really did. I thought she was a drag queen. She's got a very, like, robust contralto voice. Um, in the 80s, she was very much rocking the androgyny. Uh, so, yeah, I thought she was a drag queen. Like, this is, like, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Like, Freddie Mercury had a higher octave than... Annie Lennox does, like, ever did, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so, like, that's, so, that's how I knew I was a guy, like, when I was a little kid, is, like, I would see myself, or elements of myself, and what I could be in adults who either were men or adults who I thought were men. And I am going to do something completely different with my hair. So, yeah, like, when I see Paytas or anybody, really, making videos like that saying, of course I don't identify as a woman, I don't enjoy wearing makeup all the time. I often just wear slouchy jeans and... Swiss cheese t-shirts, yeah, because of all the holes and stuff, yeah, I and mean, yeah, if you're actually wearing that on the regular, you probably don't think of such flowery language for it, but this is me we're talking about, right? So, um, you know, like, when I see that, I, I'm legit, like, I, I, I find, as a trans person, I find that kind of, I, I find that kind of language offensive. Like I said, I, I, I almost wish, I almost wish I could take Trisha Paytas seriously with that video. Uh, but, like, first, there's the whole Kaufman thing. Um, you know, she has indeed said that she is, you know, significantly influenced by Andy Kaufman regarding her career as a performer. And I'm sure somebody's gonna accuse me of blaming the victim, but, yeah, that's just a risk that you take when you cite Andy Kaufman as an influence on your career as a performer, is there will be people who cannot, in good conscience, take anything you say seriously. And then there's the fact that, you know, if I did take this seriously, I couldn't possibly, in good consciousness, handle it with kid gloves, because that would be no better than saying I was completely in the right to be too terrified to advocate for myself, you know, in that 
seven, eight years between reading Gender Outlaw and moving out on my own at 17 and finally, tran you know, starting the medical process of transitioning that, you know, like the whole thing of like, you know, being, you know, like not only like, you know, like being poorly informed about my options on Medicare, but also like being poorly informed by a bizarre and stupid manifesto memoir hybrid that like I, I really am surprised like how I and many others were surprised when Bornstein about 10, 11 years ago started validating uh, butch flight blogging as valid feminist analysis of FTMs. Like, oh, wow, really? Okay. So, yeah, like, like, you might as well just, you know, have gone back to telling, like, 17, 18 year old me that I had every reason to, you know, be terrified and, you know, too scared to self-advocate. I had every reason to, you know, like, think that transitioning medically was forever out of my grasp and I should go forth and do all of those stupid self-destructive things I ended up doing for about seven, eight years before I finally did start transitioning, right? Like, <laughs> like, like that alone is why I can't take that seriously. And if somebody wants to, like, if somebody who didn't take me seriously at all, like, 15 years ago on Live Journal, like, okay, first off, I don't blame you, because I was being an idiot then. But secondly, it's like, you know, if you want to call me a hypocrite, fine, be that way. It's like, you know, there's a difference between somebody who is, um, like, being clearly hypocritical and somebody who has grown and learned better than what they previously knew. And what I know now is that I was wrong then. What I know now is that somebody really should have shaken me at least three or four years earlier than I ended up, you know, being shaken by a very brisk series of events. So, like, like, yeah, I, sure, you know, people can say what they want, but I know that I was completely in the wrong then on a lot of levels. And, yeah, it, and, like, I can't take Peta's claims of being trans at all seriously because Everything she says in that video, or at least that I have seen from that video, um, it is not really meaningful to me. It is just, it is just so much of the same tired, sexist accusations that I see the likes of Julie Bindle um, leveraging at trans people, especially, you know, like trans women. Um, because, you know, trans men are kind of off that kind of radar until we can be used in leverage for whatever point they're trying to make. But it's like, it's so superficial. It is so superficial that, like, I was able to articulate my gender identity in much better ways when I was half Peta's age than she did in that video. Like, so, like, when I was, like, 16 years old, I was able to articulate that, yes, I identify as male. No, it's got nothing to do with, you know, like, the clothes I like or my the interests I have. It has to do with the kind of person I've always seen myself growing up to being. And because that person conf you know because that that person here conflicts with what people were seeing here that was what you know led to a lot of gender dysphoria and one of these days i'm going to do a video on what exactly gender dysphoria is and how it can manifest because i think a lot of people who claim to be non-dysphoric genuinely don't understand what it is and 
a lot of them, though not all, do experience gender dysphoria. Like, so, like, yeah, like, these are, like, the reasons. I just cannot take it seriously when she says this. Because I, I just know better. And it's like, like I said, like, I, I understand if people, like, 15, 20 years ago weren't taking me seriously when I said that. I, like, I completely understand. I completely understand. Like, I now would not have taken me seriously then. And, like I said, I, I would have said the same things I said just now that, you know, if I were to take such claims in good faith, um, it would be with the adage that somebody's got to shake some sense into them to, um, j just to move on with their lives at that point, because I have done stupid self-destructive things because I was ill-informed, and when you are in these massive gender dysphoric pits, um, doing stupid self-destructive things seems like a really good idea. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's all I really have to say. I'm probably gonna, uh, edit this down a whole lot, uh, if I don't just end up reshooting the whole thing. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna go put some clothes on. I'm gonna go out to, uh, the, uh, little annual fall formal thing that we do at Tenet Co. approximately every October, or not October, it's November, it's November, it's November. Uh, and I said that three times, so that makes it true, right? Yes! Okay, as always, Oh, wear your sunscreen, otherwise take care of yourselves. As always, uh, there's some little thumb note, um, icons in the little thing below the video that's playing. Or maybe, like, your video is playing on the TV, like uh, does with me on my little Roku thing to stream stuff to the TV. So you gotta, like, pull up your smartphone and be like, derp, 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 hit the thumb. Like, like to hit those in one direction or another to indicate your pleasure or lack thereof with this video. Um, if you have not yet, there's a little subscribe button with a bell notification, and if you tap that, if you haven't already, uh, it, your phone will periodically scream at you when I make videos or feel like it's an okay time to stream uh, live. And as always, if you have more dollars than cents, I've got a PayPal tip jar in the description box below. I've also got Patreon and I've got some music out and I really gotta figure out, like, what the holdup is on this Mystic Fragments Records compilation. And if you are one of the, um, half dozen or so annoyed people, um, about, um, orders that you have made through my web shop, um, I had a stream last night, um, or at least last night relative to when I filmed, not when I post, but yeah, I had a recent stream wherein I, um, just, like, came clean that, like, I can barely use my hands lately, so I've, um, yeah, uh, I drop things a lot. Today is, like, the first day in a while I've been able to put on lipstick, okay? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, as always... Bats and kisses, and take care of yourselves, as I said earlier, and goodbye!